I know that most of you are already aware of the Holy Greek case, uh, but Robert Greene has been conducting a, a personal investigation. He's a, a broadcaster, a writer, but he has personally become, shall we say, highly dedicated to trying to expose the facts of this case. And those facts, if you're not already familiar with them, are truly shocking. And yet, they implicate very high levels of authority in Scotland and potentially beyond. So we need people like Mr. Green tonight to be out there in the world fighting for these cases. So we're going to hear firsthand what Robert has to share with us, but I'd love you to give a massive AV welcome to Robert Green. Well, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what to make of all that. That was the most fantastic reception I've ever had. It really is. But thank you very much indeed, and thank you for coming along to listen to this awful story. I'm afraid some of the things I will mention are very unpleasant things that people wouldn't normally want to hear, but this is such a terrible story that uh, I must uh, give you the details uh, as briefly as I possibly can. I have about an hour to speak, and... I could probably speak for about five hours on the subject, so it will have to be a truncated one. A lot of important things will have to be left out. But I will try and talk to you about the story on two levels. And there are two, two important levels in the story. Uh, one is the horror of the case itself that's been described by virtually every journalist as one of the most horrific of its kind ever in British history. And the other is the truly staggering lengths of the establishment in Scotland to cover this story up goes right to the top. It goes to Alex Salmond, the First Minister. Uh, I think one gentleman earlier on was saying how he saw the Question Time uh, program on Thursday night, in which Alex Salmond was speaking there. I can tell you that Alex Salmond is knowingly covering up for multiple child rape, rape of uh, people with disabilities, and he's covering up for a murder as well. And he knows all about this, and he does not want his government to be embarrassed. That's the word, embarrassed. So, I'll start off with the basic story itself, but before I do so, I would like to thank everybody in the audience, as many of you know about the story, and many of you have helped in some way, either by just making phone calls, somebody's even written a song for Holly, and all the other nice things that people have done. I must thank you wherever, if you're, wherever you are in the audience, if you've helped in any way, I do thank you very much. And I thank you particularly on behalf of Anne and Holly, who are two wonderful people, two of the most courageous and determined women that you will ever come across. If ever anybody deserved an award, it is those two ladies. They have been absolutely magnificent in the most appalling and trying circumstances. And one of the lovely things about them is that they've never lost their dignity or sense of balance. You might think, with all the terrible things that have happened to Holly and to her mum, that they would be embittered and sour and all the other things that often people are when they've had these terribly traumatic experiences, but not a bit of it. They're lovely, well-balanced people, as I think the people, some of the people who came to see them in uh, Berwick last week uh, will testify to. They are two really lovely, well-balanced people. How they have maintained that dignity and sense of balance, I will never know. I'm sure I couldn't have done it under those circumstances, but these are two most remarkable women, and I do hope that they will get, full, as well as justice, I do hope that they will get full recognition for everything that they've done in the course of time. Just to start you off with the, the story, if you don't know about it, is that um, in 2000, um, Holly told her mother, um, after there'd been a, a violent marital row, that um, her father and her brother had been raping her. And Holly had been raped from the age of six. Later on, uh, her father, who was a, a, a paedophile of the very worst type, started, would you believe, sharing out his daughter with members of another paedophile ring in Aberdeen. And involved in the paedophile ring was a sheriff, which is the same as a judge in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, and uh, a senior police officer, solicitor, nurses, social workers, firemen, accountant, 
all from the professions in this particular ring. And herein lies the nub of the story and why the efforts have been made to cover up for it. Uh, I still believe that if the, uh, if the perpetrators had come from perhaps a broken down estate area and were not professionals, I think this story would have been in the public domain many, many years ago. But because of the, the status of the people involved, every effort has been made to cover the story up. Anyway, uh, to begin with, Anne was told by uh, her daughter that uh, her father and son were the first people to, uh, to, to uh, abuse her, and she was told this in May 2000. Uh, at the time, the husband and son, who had been named, fled to Portugal almost immediately, so they were a little bit out of the reach of the, of the police right from the word go. Uh, a couple of months later, or three months later, on the 24th of August, Holly started telling her mother other things as well. And she started telling her mother that it wasn't just her daddy and her brother, but it was uh, um, another large group of people. And she named another 14 people, and she also named two child victims, who were, at the time must only have been four or five years old, that she'd witnessed being abused. Now, shortly after that, after uh, they'd been to the police station in Aberdeen to give all this information, 11 days later, there was a knock on Anne's door. Anne was, had a, a little flat with, uh, with her daughter, with Holly. And Anne was staggered to find no fewer than 10 people outside with a document, or allegedly having a document, to section her and take her to a mental institution. Anne had no record at all of any serious problems mentally at all, nothing whatsoever. And, but the people concerned were there to take her by force if necessary, and by force they did. They dragged her out of the flat, uh, pulled her pants down, stuck a needle into her and threw her into a van and took her off to Cornhill uh, Psychiatric Hospital in Aberdeen. Meanwhile, leaving uh, Holly screaming in terror, uh, being comforted by a neighbor, but shortly afterwards, the medical people came back and took her back to her abuser father, would you believe, who was back in the area at the time. Now, fortunately, Anne was uh, obviously was terrified for Holly even more than herself, and she described many times the helplessness she, she felt being in this institution, totally in the power of people who are out to destroy her and her daughter. Uh, unfortunately, Anne is uh, not only a, a remarkably courageous person, but a very resourceful and uh, intelligent lady. And by being a bit quite skillful, she managed to get herself out of the institution. And she went straight to a lawyer, and the lawyer recommended her to go to a, a prominent specialist in, uh, in the field, a Dr. Ellen Smith. And uh, Anne went to Dr. Smith, and asked her to examine her fully, do a proper analysis of her mental state. Dr. Smith did so and found there was no serious problems at all. She was perfectly sane. She'd obviously had a tough time, a traumatic time, but beyond that, there was nothing that wrong with her. Nothing like the schizophrenia that the doctor at Cornhill Hospital, Dr. Alistair Palin, had suggested that she had, and even Palin himself, after Dr. Dr. Smith's analysis, had to concede that there was nothing wrong with her. Something I will come back to a little later when I'm laying the blame about the people who have covered up for this. Um, the incident took place on the 5th of September where Anne was sectioned. On the 13th of October, her solicitor, Yvonne McKenna, from Glenrothes in Fife, wrote to the Scottish Mental Welfare Commission to ask them for the documents on this because Anne was certain it was an unlawful uh, sectioning in order to protect the rape gang. And I'm sure that is correct. There's no other explanation for it. Uh, a reply came back, this was sent on the 13th of October 2000. A reply came back on the 1st of November 2000. And the Scottish Mental Welfare Commission said that they had no documents whatsoever relating to the sectioning. None. Because as you know, when someone is sectioned, it has to be signed by... Uh, I think it's t in Scotland, I think it's two people at least of the states of justice of the peace in order to take that very serious action. But less than two months after the sectioning, the Scottish Mental Welfare Commission, who control all these things, admitted that they had no reference to it whatsoever. However, 
Uh, Anne was finding it rather difficult to get lawyers to act for her in Scotland, and I think it's important to say at this point that people who are not familiar with the situation in Scotland is that Scotland is, on the face of it, a multi-party democracy. The, p the parties in power in Scotland are effectively little more than puppet governments. Scotland is controlled by an unelected, elitist cabal, chiefly consisting of bankers, big business, and most alarmingly of all, the five biggest legal, firm, legal firms in Scotland. They control everything, and they certainly control the press, and the Scottish people are only ever told what the, these unelected, elitist people want them to know. The real truth, the real things that come out in Scotland that may be damaging to this coterie are never revealed in the Scottish press. So that is what uh, people have to, to put up with there, but it's, it's not as widely known as it needs to be, but obviously we hope it will be known in the course of time. Uh, now, Anne could get nowhere on this. Uh, she was having great difficulty in getting any information whatsoever, and it was quite clear that the person who was blocking uh, any investigation was the Procurator Fiscal. The Procurator Fiscal in Scotland, for those of you who don't know, uh, fulfills the role that the Crown Prosecution Service fulfil in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Uh, they're there to see whether a prosecution should go ahead on the basis of the evidence provided by the police. Uh, but Elisha Angelini, who is the Procurator Fiscal, was uh, a close associate of the Sheriff, who was involved in the rape gang, and decided that nothing was going to be done about it. The police, in fact, uh, only interviewed, well, they did interview Dennis Charles Mackey, I'll name him, he was the father of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Holly, uh, and they didn't interview anybody else, they just let him go. Uh, uh, however, uh, later on, we, got a, we did manage to get hold of a letter after Mrs. Angelini had claimed that there was, amongst other things, that there was never any mention of a paedophile gang in the report from the, uh, from the Grampian Police. And I have a letter here from the Grampian Police to the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority by a uh, Detective Sergeant Walker in which he says that he knows of 11 other people other than the father and the brother who he claims to have been, and he claims to have investigated that. But Mrs. Angelini claimed there's no, no mention of a paedophile ring was ever mentioned to her. So there's, there's 13 for a start. There's actually 16 named, but there's 13 there which the police have ever admitted to themselves. However, Anne still couldn't get anything going on this. Uh, it was totally blocked to her, totally everything. She could get nowhere. No, no solicitor would help her. The police would do nothing. The authorities were just treating her as if she didn't ex she and Holly didn't exist. However, she did make one breakthrough. Uh, thanks to some help from um, a very good uh, a financial advisor, uh, she did, and, and a very good lawyer from Enable, a lady called Nicola Smith, who's one of the very few professionals to come out of this debacle with very much credit, and they won an unexpected, um, we can't call it a bonus, it was a financial settlement of £13,500 for what had happened to Holly. Now, the curious thing about this, ladies and gentlemen, was that no crime was ever recorded by Grampian Police. There was no crime number, no anything. The perpetrator, the perpetrators, had not done anything at all. So... The money was paid out of public funds to a person who had not suffered as a result of crime, officially. So this was unprecedented, and uh, nobody's ever heard of this before. And it was on this basis, a little later on, which I'll tell you about, that the story broke initially on the 19th of April last year. And it was broken by the News of the World, um, a very good reporter there called James Mulholland, who broke the story in a rather modified fashion, but just on this basis that the, of the mystery of someone being paid for a crime that had never been committed from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority. Um, just after that, James called me to say that he'd had his editor had been bombarded with calls from the Crown Office in Edinburgh about the case. So it obviously touched a nerve very, very early on. But going back, to, uh, if I may, I've got to switch around, around a little bit chronologically, and I hope you'll be able to follow it. But it is a little complex; it's a little difficult to get in exact uh, date order. So, Anne still persisted; got absolutely nowhere with it. Uh, in 2001, there's another revelation by by Holly. 
and I, I should say at this point, Holly, as I've mentioned, has Down syndrome, but she is an intelligent person. She is a competent witness, and she is an entirely truthful witness. And this has been certified by the medical authorities, by top people in the field. They have given this absolutely clear. In fact, one of the, the medical experts said that, the, that, in her opinion, Holly was a person who was actually incapable of lying, which is often the case with people who have Down syndrome. They tend to not to be able to embellish things or elaborate or evade things in the way that other people can. And so, in effect, if they're also competent, which Holly was, a person with Down syndrome is probably the best and most reliable witness one could ever have, and Holly is that type of witness. But uh, still, nothing happened in the case. Nothing, nothing could, be, could be done. Anne tried for about eight or nine years uh, to try to get something going, even with the press. Nobody wanted to know. And it was uh, late in 2008 when I was first approached to come into the case myself by a, a very loyal and patriotic Scotsman called uh, Stuart Usher, who leads an organization called Scot Scotland Against Crooked Lawyers, who for many years has been badly bravely, bravely trying to expose the corruption and rottenness of the Scottish legal system. And uh, I was invited to, do a, a, to make a speech to their uh, annual conference there about another serious case, I was very serious case I was dealing with in London about corruption in the, in the travel industry. Uh, and as a result of that, Stuart asked me afterwards if there's anything at all I could do for these two poor ladies who'd had to flee from their home in Aberdeen to a little village in Shropshire in order to be safe from members of the gang and all the threats that they were, were, were suffering from. So uh, I tried to get things going a little bit and eventually managed to, to find J James Mulholland who took the case on. Uh, this was quickly followed up in the media by the Shropshire Star, by another very good journalist there called Sue Austin. And immediately following that, I got a call from Mark Daly from the BBC in Glasgow. And Mark Daly is uh, a well-known investigative journalist. Uh, some of you will recall a programme that he, was, he received an award for, and it was called The Secret Policeman, in which he infiltrated Cheshire Police to discover incidences of uh, racism within the police force. And he successfully discovered that there was, and uh, he got a lot of plaudits for it, and got awards, and was uh, roundly regarded as one of the best investigators that the BBC had. Now, Mark approached me, and we had a number of discussions with uh, Anne and Holly, Anne and Holly and myself, and we provided all the documents that supported the story. Because I, I must say at this point that and being a very resourceful and well-organized person, has been assiduous in keeping documents. And without those documents, there is absolutely no way that we could have got, made any progress with the case. I couldn't have taken the case had it not been for the fact that she had very, very good documentation to back up everything that she'd, she'd claimed. So we went over that. Um, there was uh, other members of the team, BBC, joined in. And we had about six or seven weeks of discussion on that. Mark Daly sent an email, which a copy which I have here, saying that two programmes are being commissioned, one with BBC Television Scotland, one with BBC Radio Scotland, and almost certainly a third programme was going to come out nationally throughout the UK with Panorama. Uh, they came down to Shropshire, talked to Anne and Holly, everything was, uh, everything was in order, it was all going to go ahead until the 10th of June uh, last year when I received a call from Mark Daly as well as my client too received a call saying that they'd been prevented from doing the program. Someone had told them that, that they in fact would be sacked if they pursued not only Holly's case, but any other cases of paedophilia in Scotland that Mark had told me about. So the three journalists there, which were uh, Mark Daly, Cathy Long and Liam McDougall of, of Panorama were all blocked from do, taking on this terrible story. Of course, this was a, 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 they, they would not reveal who, had, uh, who in fact had stopped them, and uh, I did make uh, inquiries, repeated inquiries, to the Director General Mark Thompson and the head of the BBC Drust, Sir Michael Lyons, asking them for an explanation for this uh, um, um, astonishing about turn. But I got absolutely nowhere. Nobody would come up with anything. No one would answer any of the questions. 
and uh, I think we, it was fairly clear that uh, they'd been warned off at, at a very high level indeed. And of course, the question was, who would want to stop this kind of story? Not just Holly's story, but exposing paedophilia. And one of the questions I posed to uh, both uh, the Director General and the Head of the Trust was that, uh, why would it be that people like Mark Daly in particular would get an award, and he, uh, I think he deserved it, for exposing racism, but when he wants to expose paedophilia, he's threatened with a sack. How could the BBC answer that one? Well, they couldn't, and they never have. So, we, anyway, we still had to pursue matters and try to get things going again, although I was convinced that, from a media point of view, the BBC, story, the BBC episode itself would become a story in itself, which it has done. And curiously enough, before the story came out, Mark said that this is a story that will go around the world. Never heard anything like this before, both the story and the cover-up. Because it has gone around the world now, as many of you know, and we've got millions of people all over the place who are sending their best wishes and following the story at every turn, and that is a wonderful thing. And it's wonderful for Anne and Holly because uh, they, they so much, I can tell you, they so much appreciate all the support and all the love that they're receiving from everywhere. It means so much to them to have that support. Because poor Holly, for nine years after she told her mother about the rapes, no one would believe her. She used to have nightmares at night because no one believed. It's bad enough going through these terrible, terrible ordeals and then finding that nobody believes you when you tell them. But that was the case. But now, one, at least one good thing that we've, we've managed to achieve on this is that Holly doesn't have nightmares anymore because she knows everybody is behind her. And she knows there's just a small group of very bad but powerful people who are stopping her and the other children getting justice. And I should add at this point that, uh, that Anne, uh, as I say, is a wonderful person. And she doesn't just want uh, justice for a daughter and for her brother who was murdered, which I'll go on to in a little while, uh, she also wants justice for all the other children. All, she, we know at least seven other victims. We know their identities who suffered at the hands of the rape gang. And uh, also, of course, for her brother. And she also does not want, as far as possible, any other mothers to go through what she has had to go through. So she really is working not just for a daughter, but for other people as well. And she always makes that very clear. Uh, one thing I should also mention, because I might forget to say it later, many people have said, how can they support Holly and, and, and Anne and the rest of it? And many people from different parts of the world have suggested that they pay money. Well, this is something that Anne does not want. So if anybody wants to support Anne and Holly, uh, they're not going to accept any money at all, even though people have been very kind in offering to donate huge amounts, I, I can tell you. But the point is, it's not about money, it's about justice. And Anne is very conscious about the fact that she doesn't want anybody thinking that she's doing this for money or that I'm doing it for money or anything else. That's not, that doesn't come into it whatsoever. That, that is something, a position that we will retain. So any of you here who perhaps offered anything, thank you very much for it. That's the reason, and I think you'll understand why we, we're refusing any donations whatsoever. So we've, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a, a severe battle, but uh, we're, we're getting there very, very slowly. Um, one of the things I'll move on to now was um, the exposure of the Lord Advocate of Scotland, Elise Angelini. Now, earlier on, of course, I mentioned that she was the Procurator Fiscal of Aberdeen when the story first came out in 2000. And when, the, when, we, when we brought the story up again uh, in 2009, I wrote to Mrs. Angelini and I wrote to Alex Salmond as well to uh, tell them that we had information that they were, in fact, blocked the story in 2000. Well, Mrs. Angelini issued a public statement. Well, she didn't do it once. She's done it on more than one occasion, especially when she's been threatening the media that she'll virtually put them out of business if they don't do as she says and don't desist from even talking about her role in the case. And in the letter that she, uh, she put out publicly or a lawyer put out publicly, it said that Mrs. Angelini didn't know ab about the fact that there was um, a gang involved, which we've already shown is complete nonsense. But not only that, that she did not know anything about the case, was not aware of it, was not even in situ in the case, and hence had no, no, nothing at all to do with the case whatsoever. Right? 
Now, I found that she was doing this all through uh, one of her assistants, a man called Andrew McIntyre, who's the head of diversity and victims in Edinburgh. And we had an exchange of letters, and I got a bit fed up of this. Mrs. Angeli saying she had nothing to do with it and all the rest of it. So I rang Mr. McIntyre one day, and I said, uh, Mr. McIntyre, I think we need, need, really need to come clean about this. Uh, you know, Mrs. Angelini, your boss, is in severe trouble over this, I can tell you. And he said, well, no, she said that she doesn't know anything about it, and she wasn't even there at the time. I said, oh, yes, she was. I said, I've been doing a bit of checking, and it's a matter of public record that Elish Angelini was appointed as regional procurator fiscal for the Grampian area, based in Aberdeen, on the 21st of July, 2000. And don't forget, it was the 25th of August when Anne went to the police station to tell them about the other members of the gang that included her close associate, one of the sheriffs in Aberdeen. So we had that information. Mr. McIntyre didn't really know what to say, but uh, what he did say was that, well, I, I suppose it must have been other members of her staff who dealt with it. Uh, so I said, I, I find that extremely implausible, that given the severity and gravity of the allegations, that the boss wasn't told about this gang that was going, including one of her close associates, that they never told her. He said, well, that's all I can think of. Well, I said, it just happens that um, I have a, a letter here um, dated the 27th of October 2000, three months after Mrs. Angelini had been appointed. And the letter is sent to Mrs. Angelini by Anne and Holly's MSP, Mr. Brian Adam. And this is directly addressed to Mrs. Angelini in which she asks how she's getting on with the case, what progress has she made which rather stumped Mr. McIntyre, as you can imagine. He didn't really know what to say, and uh, obviously there wasn't much more of a conversation, certainly from his side, after that. Also, uh, don't forget Miss Angelini didn't know anything about the case, wasn't involved with the case, all the rest of it. We actually have another letter here, dated the 12th of July, 2001, almost a year after Mrs. Angelini had been appointed. And this is a letter with Mrs. Angelini's name right across the top to uh, Anne's solicitor at the time, Yvonne McKenna. Just, it, it, the content isn't really that important, but it's talking about the case. So she's a liar. And I wish she was here today, because I would tell her to her face. Uh, Mr. Salmond, Alex Salmond, was informed about the deception, the deceptions by his, uh, his Lord Advocate last summer. I suggested to them that in the circumstances she had perverted the course of justice and was now seeking to conceal the facts about this terrible case from the Scottish people and that she should, dismissed, should be dismissed without further ado. Mrs. Angelini is still there, not surprisingly enough, despite everything that's gone on and the fact that we now, uh, have, we now believe, or we're, we're pretty sure, that she's actually used public funds to try and threaten members of the press through the law firm Levy and McRae. They've been repeatedly threatened people in the Scottish press. They've also threatened people outside Scotland. I know that they threatened uh, Brian Gerrish from the UK column. They threatened Google, and they threatened other people as well, all at the expense of the Scottish taxpayer. So she is involved in criminal activities, perverting the course of justice, and is using the money that should, for, to stop the people who should be hearing about it from hearing about the story. Because, for sure, Scotland is a wonderful country, and the people in Scotland, and I think many of you who visited Scotland will probably agree with me, are some of the, the best and kindest people that you'll find anywhere in the world. And they would be on the streets if they heard about this. And Mr. Salmond and his gang would be finished. But they daren't let that out, dare they? Or, well, not so far, but uh, I think we're going to get it out one way or another. So and that is Mrs. Angelini's role in, in the case. Um, a little bit later on, uh, we, I, um, I was still getting a little bothered about the lack of uh, guts shown by the general media on this. Uh, in Scotland, to a certain extent in England, although the English press were saying, oh, well, this is really a Scottish story. I don't think our readers would want to know about this. And I said, I disagree. This story is so awful that I think it's a national story. And the BBC certainly thought it was a national story until they got, uh, got frightened off. 
But that was the way it was. So anyway, as I got a bit fed up with all this, uh, I'd already named some of the people in, uh, in uh, some of the, uh, the documents that were on the web at the time. And I decided that I would try to shame the media into taking up the story by calling a public meeting, which I did on the 3rd of October at the Quakers Hall in uh, Edinburgh. And in the meeting, I invited everybody there. I invited actually all the people who I was making allegations against to come forward, including the priest, police, including the media, including some of the, uh, the people who had been involved. Uh, I invited them to come. And I said I would give them a platform. I was going to attack them publicly. I was going to name them publicly. But if they wanted to come, and if they disagreed with anything that I said, I would give them the chance in front of an audience to actually state their case and give a full explanation because none of them turned up. Uh, and I made the statement, and I named all the perpetrators that we, we knew at the time, and I also named all the victims. And I handed around leaflets with details of the story, many, much of which you know about already. Thank you very much. Did I get any reaction? Did anybody try to threaten me? Not the person, nobody. Nobody said a word. So we soldiered on. On the, four, oh, and there is something in between that I should, should say. Um, early on in 2009, when I first got onto the story, through a bit of pressure, we did manage to get Grampian police to say that they would have a, another look at the case. We didn't hold out much hope, but um, that's what they said. But of course, nothing happened. They just made all kinds of excuses and all the rest of it, and obviously thought we would just get fed up and go away. But an incident happened uh, in August, shortly after I'd been putting pressure on the, uh, on the Lord Advocate and on the, the members of the gang who I was I already started to name. And that was that Anne and Holly in their little village, little house, and little quiet village in Shropshire, one night had a shot fired at their window. Fortunately, it bounced off. It was fired at head height. So, as soon as that happened, of course, Anne rightly called West Mercia Police, uh, the police uh, force covering the area in which she lives. They came to have a look at it and obviously couldn't do very much with it, as, as you wouldn't really expect. But I immediately contacted the chief constable of uh, Grampian Police, a man called Colin McCarricker, and I also contacted Alex Salmond as well, and I told these two gentlemen that th due to the tardiness of Grampian police in investigating this, the lives of my clients were now at risk and I would hold them personally responsible if any harm came to either of the ladies as a result of this uh, failure to act promptly. Well, in very short order, they did send up two, they sent down two officers down to Shropshire to interview Anne and Holly. And on the 8th of September, we met at the main police station in Shrewsbury, which is the nearest town to where uh, Anne and Holly live. And we were taken from there to a, a house nearby where they, kind of ha they use, tend to use houses to uh, usually to, to interview rape victims because it's rather less intimidating than the austerity of a police station. And Tanya Leeper, one of the two uh, officers, went upstairs to interview Anne, accompanied by two officers from the West Mercia Force. And Holly was interviewed downstairs by Lisa Evans from Grampian, and she was uh, accompanied by another officer from West Mercia and a social worker. I wasn't allowed to sit in on either of the interviews. Obviously, the interview I wanted to sit in was Holly's, quite obviously, for obvious reasons. But the, the layout of the house was such that uh, Holly was being interviewed in the lounge and there was a, a rather th a thin partition door between the lounge and the kitchen where I was sitting. So I got my chair, went straight up to the partition, notebook, right against the partition. And because, partly because Holly has hearing difficulties, the conversation, the interview, had to be conducted at a higher decibel level than a normal conversation. So hence I was able to hear just about everything that went on. Well. The interview was, was, uh, the interview was uh, conducted in a correct manner. I had no serious uh, complaints about the way the interview took place. But it lasted for three and a half hours. And can you imagine, three and a half hours, a young girl having to relay all the rapes 
dozens, hundreds of rapes on her. Uh, and that was absolutely awful and absolutely harrowing. Uh, but Holly was magnificent. Uh, for three and a half hours, she was absolutely terrific. And everything I heard her say was exactly consistent with everything that I'd read before, everything I'd heard when the BBC questioned her, and all the other things that had been taking place and the names and everything else, everything else was consistent. And there she was, she named again the 16 perpetrators and the eight victims. She was one of them, seven other ones. And I did think that at the time maybe the police would do something about it because her evidence was so clear. However, but it was probably the most harrowing thing I've ever heard in my life and I do hope I don't have to hear anything like that again. It was, and the words that haunted me uh, when the police officer said, how many times did this happen to you, Holly? How many times did they do this to you? And Holly just said the words over and over, over and over. And th this was, you know, I think you can all imagine listening to something like that. This is something you're never, never going to ever forget. But Holly was absolutely fantastic. She's an incredibly brave person and her mum too. They're, they're just fantastic people. But we left it to the police then, hoped something would happen. Uh, and received a letter on the 4th of December. That was really the next significant thing from the, as far as the case is concerned. We'll talk a little bit more about the media in a moment. 4th of December, letter comes from the Procurator Fiscal, Mr. Stephen McGowan in Aberdeen. Now, in, in the course of the letter, he said that they decided not to take any further action because of insufficient evidence. Insufficient evidence, right? However, an interesting, uh, well, I'll go about the insufficient evidence for, first of all. We already had found that through a lot of very brave people in Scotland, some of whom can't be named for, for obvious reasons, when you live in a state like Scotland, you can understand that you, you really, you, you have to be very brave to stand up. And we discovered through journalists and through other people as well that none of the people named had ever even been interviewed by Grampian Police. Neither had any key witnesses, one of whom I will be talking to you about in a little while. Now, uh, the, another curious thing about the letter was that Mr. McGowan, who would normally be the person who would decide on this, made it quite clear that he hadn't himself decided on this. He wouldn't make a decision on it, but instead he had passed it to the main Crown Office in Edinburgh, which is headed, of course, by the Lord Advocate, Mrs. Elise Angelini. But he wouldn't name exactly who it was who had actually blocked the investigation. So I made a few calls. I spoke to Mr. McGowan's office, and nobody would tell me anything other than it was somebody in Edinburgh who'd made the decision. So I made a couple of calls to Edinburgh. So I was determined to find out the identity of the person who had blocked. I was pretty sure who it was, but I wanted to try and see if somebody would actually admit to it. Anyway, after a number of calls, on the 18th of December last year, I spoke to the Crown Office in Edinburgh, and I was put through to a lady called Catherine Harper. Now, Catherine Harper is a lawyer, and she is the head of the department dealing with uh, all kinds of uh, problems to do with sexual abuse. That's her remit at the Crown Office. And I put it to her again, who was it who stopped this investigation? Who, tell me, tell the name, give me the name of the person who blocked it. And Mrs. Harper got very nervous and agitated and clearly wanted to get off the line, but I was determined to keep her on the line. And I thought she just put the phone down. I thought, I, I'm, I'm not going to get anything out of this woman. She's getting too worked up about it. But she did stay on the line. And eventually I said, come on, tell the truth. This is really, really important. I need to know who has stopped this. And she whispered to me, the Lord Advocate. I said, thank you very much. I thought that would be the case. That is all I wanted to know. So we now know that Mrs. Angelini once again personally had blocked the case to cover herself, obviously. Um, now... I'm going to move on to another item of this, uh, this horrifying story, and this is the murder of Robert David Gregg. Now, Robert David Gregg was known as Roy, and he was the brother of Anne, and hence the uncle of Holly. Now, when Anne and uh, Roy were young, Roy was six years older than Anne, 
they lost their father while they were still, I think Anne was 11 and Roy was 17. And Roy, being the decent kind of person that he is, took it upon himself to look after his widowed mother and his younger sister as best he could. And he always did that. And when Anne herself got married and had children, he was wonderful to her children as well and was particularly devoted to Holly, probably because of her condition. He did a lot of things for her. He did a lot of things for the Downs Association and was really a really good, decent man. Very popular man. He wasn't married, but he was a bar manager. And uh, he... He, he, didn't, he wasn't much of a drinker, he didn't like drinking, he certainly didn't like whiskey, uh, but he liked to like sport, he liked to read, and he liked just to have a good time and talk to his mates and all the rest of it. Just one of those straightforward kinds of people, but a really, really decent person. Now, in, 2000, uh, in 1997, Roy mysteriously died in a car fire uh, just outside Aberdeen. No one really knew the reason about this. The uh, police investigated and decided that it was an unexplained death and that it was probably suicide. And the pathologist put on, uh, in his opinion, that Roy Gregg died from smoke inhalation. This is on the night of the 17th of November, 1997. No one in the family could imagine why Roy could possibly have committed suicide and why he was in that location. It was a part of the city that he... It was outside in the country, actually, but an area which he would never normally go to. And he didn't drive very much. He didn't like driving, so he wouldn't go out and have a drive round or anything like that. They could not understand it. And they suspected that something awful had happened to him. But there was no way in which they could, could really do anything about it. And, of course, they didn't know any motive why, of why anybody would want to kill him. Not at the time. But they couldn't, they, they were total mystery. And one other curious thing at the time was they couldn't get hold of the autopsy. The family, the Crown Office to control these things wouldn't provide an autopsy to the family. Of course, they didn't think too deeply about it at the time. They were just distressed, as, as well they might be. But they couldn't really pursue it much further. Now, this would have possibly remained a mystery but for an incident in 2001. And again, I'll just talk about the condition of people with Down syndrome. They tend to give information out uh, at different intervals. They wouldn't give you all the information all at once. They tell you things at different times. And Holly would not have been able to connect a couple of incidents together, which will become apparent in a second. In I think, April or May of 2001, Holly said to her mum, you know, mum, she said to him, Uncle Roy caught Daddy having sex with me, you know. And, of course, Anne was horrified about this. What? Are you sure? Holly said, yes, yes, he did, Mummy. Yes, he caught, he caught Daddy having sex with me. And I said, what happened? What, what did Uncle Roy say? He said, Uncle Roy said, don't you touch Holly again. Don't you ever touch her again. And Anne started to when would this be, Holly? Can we just try and remember when, when this happened? And by a process of elimination, they discovered that it took place about two or three weeks prior to Roy's death. Right? Still no autopsy. So, Anne was convinced at that time that, uh, that her, her brother had been murdered. And when I first became involved with the story, uh, Anne told me this. And um, I said to her, Anne, I believe you about your brother, but... The story is so fantastic. If we're going to get this story out into the media and to, to get justice, because we're going to have great difficulty here, I, I, I can't say anything other than that, um, people are going to find it too fantastic. The story itself, as it stands, is something that a lot of people would find totally incredible. They'd say, oh, it's a work of a fantasist. It's like a Dan Brown on a bad day. You know, it's just unbelievable. You know, so we'll leave the... I do believe you about your brother, but let's just leave it out for the moment. So we did. And it was only further on into the autumn, when uh, we were still trying to get all these things out, that I said, well, I think we'll revisit the situation with your brother now. Let's, let's have another go at this. And uh, I think it's time that we, we up the, the tempo on this particular aspect of the story. Because it's quite clear that a lot of people are beginning to believe what we say about Holly, even though we haven't made a real breakthrough in the mainstream media yet. But let's look a little bit further into Roy's case now, because, uh, you know, we're not going to let this one drop. 
So we again approached the Crown Office for the autopsy. And again, they sort of dilly-dallied and wouldn't answer, and we per persisted with them. And we had a call one day to say, from the Crown Office, to say that it wasn't the policy of the Crown Office to pass on the autopsy, even to Anne, who was the closest living relative. Uh, what they normally did was to get a doctor to come on the phone and explain what the autopsy meant. Because if you weren't qualified, you might not understand what it all came to. So the, uh, they would get a doctor who'd come on the phone, speak to Anne, and tell Anne exactly how the autopsy should be interpreted. Well, we said, we're not having that. So send us the autopsy, and if we don't understand it, if we're confused about anything, we will get a doctor or a specialist or a pathologist just to go over it and explain it all to us if we don't know anything. Now, don't forget, smoke inhalation was the cause, allegedly the cause of the death of, uh, of Roy Gregg. The autopsy eventually arrived on the 31st of December last year, 2009, uh, about three and a half weeks after uh, Angelini had blocked the case. Anne was terribly distressed when she received it because within the autopsy, autopsy it described that Roy had suffered from uh, damage to the skull, two broken ribs, and a broken back. And this was smoke inhalation, according to the autopsy. Well, I had the names of the two, the two pathologists and uh, I um, decided I would, one of them looked as if he was the senior pathologist. But before ringing him, I made a few inquiries with other few medical experts, uh, informal inquiries, I have to say, and retired pathologists, and some of my, my colleagues who've been helping so bravely in the case did the same thing. And the general view was, having been given the facts, but without telling them about the motive, I, this is important, we decided we would not tell the people that we talked to that there was a motive for murder. We just left the things, the autopsy as it was, and said, if you, were a, if you received this, what would you think? And the, the consensus was that Roy Gregg had been badly beaten, had whiskey poured down his throat, and thrown into the burning vehicle. And that was the way that he died. So, I spoke to the pathologist who uh, prepared the, the autopsy and uh, I asked him about it. Uh, he was obviously a little nervous, as one might expect. And he said, but I did remember the case. Uh, and I said, well, what did you make of it? Um, and he, he said, well, we looked at it very thoroughly and uh, I made my decision, you know, on the, on the basis of what I saw there. And then I told him about the, uh, the motive for murder. And he was, seemed a little bit taken aback by that. And I, I do believe, actually, that he was unaware of it. Uh, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on that. I may be wrong, but that's how I feel. Uh, but we had a, a, disc a further discussion. And obviously, I didn't want to get into too deep a discussion with a, a, an established expert on a subject of which I know nothing. But I did say one thing that come up occurred, that came up frequently with the other experts that I talked to, and it was this. They said that it is virtually unknown for a person to commit suicide by fire. The only people who ever do this tend to be political activists or people who've got a past record of being disturbed. But neither of these conditions applied to Roy Gregg. In the normal way, if a death occurs by fire in that way, it is almost certainly arson, which is used to cover up crimes and destroy evidence. So arson would be the logical way of looking at a case like this. But of course, the police never looked at it that way, and neither did the pathologist. Um, the pathologist then said, uh, got obviously even more nervous after I'd uh, made this point when I said well why didn't it go to a full investigation surely with your experience you must have thought like all the other experts have been telling me it, it must have been it's almost certainly foul play but he said oh, oh he says it sounds as if you're trying to implicate me in all this I said implicate me in all what and he said, oh, no, whatever you're talking about, whatever you talk well, I just did my best. I just acted on what I'd seen there. I, I, I just did the right thing. I said, right. Obviously, the 
conversation didn't last much longer. I'd have liked it to have lasted longer, but uh, the doctor, the good doctor, didn't really want to talk to me very much more about this, apart from the fact he got extremely nervous indeed, and wouldn't talk to me again when I'd given him a day or two to perhaps cool down and get over his, uh, his nervousness. So uh, that, that was the, the, the situation over the, the death of Roy Gregg. Uh, another important thing to recall about this is that one of the police officers who was named as a member of the rape gang was one of the senior forensic officers at Grampian Police. And I asked the doctor if he knew this particular officer. And the doctor said, yes, I've worked with him often. And I said to him, did you happen to work with him on this particular case, the Roy Gregg? And the doctor said, oh, I, I can't remember. I, I really can't remember. I don't know the answer to that. Not sure whether he was lying or whether he couldn't remember, but it would, I, I think it's a fairly good chance that he may well have been involved in that, but we don't know. But it's, it's quite clear, whatever the situation, is that no proper investigation was, was conducted. Um, now, perhaps move on a little bit now to uh, the situation about my arrest, which many people know about. Uh, on the 31st of January, uh, I um, made a speech in Newcastle, which was uh, filmed, and it was put on the internet, and some of you may have seen it, and it did create something of a stir, but not as much of a stir as the one that was created on the 12th of February. Because as we were still having difficulty in getting the media to do anything, I decided that one good way of getting this into the public domain would be to stand as a candidate in the coming general election. I proposed to stand in the, uh, the constituency of Aberdeen South, where most of the rapes took place, uh, standing solely on the issue of Holly Gregg. Nothing else, just Holly Gregg as an independent candidate. And I uh, told everyone that on the 12th of February, I was going to go up to Aberdeen, because uh, a city I'd never even visited before, to introduce, pe to introduce people to Aberdeen to me, so they knew who I was, and I was going to hand out leaflets, again, with all the names of all the people involved, and the other issues to do with Roy Gregg and all the rest of it. And I'd arranged to meet several members of the media at half past 10 in the morning, and uh, lots of people who wanted to come and, and, and support uh, Han Ann and Holly at the same time. Anyway, didn't quite make it because uh, at 10 o'clock that morning, uh, I was just on a little side street, just off Union Street, when suddenly I was pounced on by a couple of plainclothes CID officers who said, are you George Robert Green? And I said, yes, then we, so when we have a warrant for your arrest on the breach of the peace. So just walking along Aberdeen with my, <laughs> my case and, uh, and, uh, and that was it. Anyway, they took me to Queen Street Police Station, the main police station in Aberdeen. Uh, they interviewed me. Uh, they told me they also got a warrant to go down to my home in Cheshire. They took my keys off me to go down to my home in Cheshire. And four officers went all the way from Aberdeen to where I live in Cheshire, 700 mile round trip, and raided my house and took just about everything I had of any value in the house, all my equipment, all my confidential information, lots of things that had absolutely nothing to do with the case and were to do with other clients that I had. They've taken six weeks ago and I still haven't got them back. So they did all that. But one of the interesting things was that um, I was released on bail on the 15th of February, on the Monday. They held me in sort of solitary confinement over the weekend. And I had absolutely no idea what was going on in the outside world, not a, not a thing. And it was only when I was about to, uh, when the duty solicitor came along and uh, showed me the bail conditions and told me that the Crown Office did not want me to be released at all. They wanted me to, to remain in police custody until it was time for, for me to have a trial. So this was just for walking along the street in Aberdeen. Now, there was one interesting thing, actually, it, Strictly speaking, I guess that isn't quite accurate because the breach of the peace was backdated to the 9th of June, 2009. So I said to them, well, if you thought I was breaking the law on the, on the 9th of June, 2009, why did it take you till the 12th of February, 2010, before doing anything about it? Well, he couldn't answer that. 
Of course, the only reason that they wanted to stop me was it coincided with the time that I was ready to stand uh, in, for the parliamentary elections. And they couldn't face that because obviously I would be able to say anything I wanted, really. And it would, I, I guess I wouldn't have got elected, but it would have forced all the other candidates to address the problem. All the candidates in Aberdeen South, and I'm sure in all the neighboring constituencies, would have had to have dealt with the problem. And it would have been the major talking point without any question in the general election in that part of Scotland. But they couldn't have that, could they? Because poor Mrs. Angelini might be a bit embarrassed about it. So th this obviously promotes another thing about constitutional matters. Uh, it means that a ruling party, in this case the Scottish National Party, can in effect stop an ind independent candidate from coming forward if they want to. If, if someone wants to say something that the, the ruling government doesn't like, uh, they can just uh, bang you up on a breach of the peace situation and silence you that way. It sounds something like what, something would happen in Nazi Germany or Stalin's Russia, doesn't it? Just that same kind of thing totally against democracy and even completely forgetting about the Holly Gregg case for one moment it is still in my opinion a very serious attack on democracy and has very very serious implications for anyone who's prepared to stand against a ruling government and say things that that government does not like Thank you very much. Uh, now, on that particular point, nobody seems to have the answer yet. I'd be very grateful if someone, some eminent person, could give the answer. I've spoken to the Electoral Commission, and they have no idea whether electoral law supersedes criminal law in this matter. So it's possible I could go to, to Scotland, and I'm banned from Aberdeenshire, by the way, and I'm told if I ever enter Scotland, I'll get arrested. Uh, so, but. Um, it means that um, if I went there, it would have to be a test case. They'd probably arrest me, and then we would have to go through all kinds of things that would take forever to be proven. And I might win or I might not win. But nobody knows at the moment whether I would win the case or not. There's also another little interesting constitutional point to do with this as well, which I'll just mention very briefly. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, just very other institute. It means this means actually, in effect that I have been prevented, or not necessarily prevented, but my pos the possibility of me campaigning has been damaged by a party for whom neither I nor any of my compatriots in England, Wales, or Northern Ireland could possibly have voted for the Scottish National Party, because they don't stand in any of those countries. So what it means in effect is the Scottish National Party who won power in the Scottish election are preventing a person from standing in a British general election. And that is yet another constitutional conundrum that no one has really been able to, uh, to solve at the moment. So that's the situation we, we have on that. Now, there's so many things that I would like to say, but obviously I haven't got time to put all of them in, but I am going to mention a couple of other points. Um, people who I think should be in severe trouble over this, quite apart from Mrs. Angelini and the gang themselves. Now, Scottish Mental Welfare Commission uh, have repeatedly refused to open an inquiry into Anne's case. I mentioned earlier that she was sectioned, we believed unlawfully, and the Scottish authorities can find no document to support the sectioning of Anne Gregg. Right? The man in charge at the moment, the director, a man called Dr. Donald Lyons, and I and other people have been in touch with him. I've phoned him up, I've written to him, and Dr. Donald Lyons decides that despite everything, he can find no reason to open an inquiry into this case. No reason. I think Dr. Lyons should be sacked. I think he's letting down the people who he purports to represent. He's paid, I understand, about 120,000 a year and he's, all he is is just a lapdog for the Crown Office and Mrs. Angelini and Mr. Salmond and all the rest of it. He's supposed to act independently, but he's not doing. And actually, we do have documentary evidence to, that he's been in touch with the Crown Office about this case. So he's nailed, for one. Now, another very disturbing, uh, uh, per, a disturbing situation arose um, in October of this year. And I haven't mentioned it until last week or so because I wanted to make sure that no 
innocent person was going to be seriously damaged by this. I would like to have brought it up earlier, especially when we heard about the BBC and Mark Daly, who claimed that he hadn't been threatened at all once, the, once it all got into the, the, the worldwide in, in February. And this is to do with the Down Syndrome Association, but not based in Scotland, but based here in this area, not very far from here, in Teddington in Middlesex, where their head office is. Now, at the start of the campaign, um, we talked to um, two people who kind of run the press side of things at the Down Syndrome Association, a lady called uh, Susanna Seaman and the press officer called John Smithies. Now, those two people were wonderful, actually. They backed us absolutely fully, and because they had evidence of many people all over, the, uh, all over the UK, not just Scotland, but people with Down syndrome and with other learning difficulties being sexually abused because the people who did it to them thought that they wouldn't be able to testify against them properly. They were very anxious to take this up as a test case. And they said, we really want you to win this. We're 100% behind you. And at every stage of the, the campaign, we informed the Down Syndrome Association, we sent them the press cuttings, such as that were, were available. We talked about all the negotiations we had. I talked to them about my going to Edinburgh and holding a public meeting, which I would name all the people concerned, and they gave us, they were terrific, they gave us 100% backing. Until late in October. And I received a call one Thursday from John Smithies. And he said to me, uh, Robert, he said, uh, can I talk to you? And I said, sure, okay, John, what is it? He said, I'm a bit bothered. He said, um, I've been, obviously, you know we're backing you on this, and I've put details, which are already in the public domain, in internal documents within the Down Syndrome Association, not published it outside, but within the association. He says, have you, um, have you had any legal action taken against you, any threats or anything like that? And I said, no, John, no, I haven't, even after the public meeting. I've had no reaction whatsoever. And so he said, um, well, he said, the thing is, he says, the chief executive officer, a lawyer, I think significantly, called Carol Boys, has summoned me to a meeting on Monday about this. He said, I'm a bit worried about it. I said, well, John, I don't really think you've got anything that you should worry about, because if it's been kept internally, and it's in the public domain anyway, and no legal action has been taken against me or against anybody else, to the best of my knowledge, over this, I don't really see, I don't think you should have anything to worry about, but I you know, hope it goes well for you. Anyway, I next spoke to John on Tuesday. I rang him up, and he sounded distressed, and he said, Robert, I've been sacked. He says, she sacked me. I said, what? He says, yes, she sacked me. I said, what for? And she says, Carol Boyce said that he, she thought that what I was doing was, was, could, was likely to put the Down Syndrome Association in jeopardy, that, that someone might sue us over this. And I've been sacked. And I said, John, this is terrible. You know, you're a good man, you're a brave man, and you're doing what, you, you, your duty towards all the people who are suffering, and we, we're grateful for this. I said, look, you know, I'll... Uh, if you want anybody to speak up for you, I'll speak up for you as a tribune or anything else. And I'm sure that Anne will do the same because she thinks very highly of you too. This is terrible. And he said, well, Robert, said, no, I've been told I shouldn't really speak to you about this. He said, I think I've got a good chance of winning, but I, and I, don't, I shouldn't really speak to you. But speak to Susanna. Yes, Susanna knows all about it. Susanna is a lovely lady. She really is. But would she speak to me? Would she speak to Anne? No, she wouldn't. Not a word. She avoided all our calls. So I decided to pursue uh, Carol Boys then. And I said, and I tried to phone her up. She wouldn't take my calls. I emailed her. And I said, why have you done this to, to a good man, a good, decent man? You're betraying the people who you're supposed to be taking care of here. You really are. This is disgraceful. I think you should resign. But I want an explanation. I said, was it you or has somebody got at you? I think somebody's got at you. But of course, she wouldn't respond. She just ignored everything. And eventually, I did get a, a sort of message from another person saying, Mr. Green, this is none of your business, and I'm not even going to discuss it with you. But Carol Boys is another person, I believe, has betrayed the people whom she's responsible for protecting in the most callous way possible. And she's another person, in my view, should go. And the Down Syndrome Association get a lot of money from the government. They get a lot of people for, who support the organization privately, and that's a very good thing. 
but I don't think people should be giving too much money to that organisation until the, the chief executive officer is dismissed or, re, or forced to resign because she is betraying everything. Uh, I've got one final thing I'll just end up, and this is to do with the, um, the action that's been taken by the sheriff, not only the, uh, the criminal action about breach of peace, but also uh, the sheriff in question has taken action, uh, an indictment against me, as I should never mention his name or cause him any distress or any of the other people in, in his uh, group. Uh, without mentioning his name, which most of you know of anyway, and there's a picture of him all over the internet anyway, but I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> but uh, he's, in, in his interdict, um, he has made two false statements. And on the 18th of June last year, I took the precaution of doing something that I thought might be of some value later. And I wrote a letter to him asking him if he knew the names, if he knew the people that I'd listed, who I knew were regular visitors to the home of his sister, where most of the, the, the orgies and awful things took place. I didn't mention his sister or brother-in-law, but I mentioned all the other people, including uh, Anne's ex-husband and her son. And on the 24th of June, I received a reply from uh, the clerk at the sheriff's office saying that the sheriff didn't know any of these people and was not involved with them in any way at all. Okay? Didn't know them. Him. Right, and anyway, this was put in the interdict against me. Put this in again that I'd written to on the 18th of June, on the 24th of June, got a reply saying knew nothing about them, wasn't involved in any way at all. And the, the firm of solicitors who the, uh, sh the sheriff is employing is uh, an Edinburgh firm called Simpson and Marwick. Okay? Now, uh, I, uh, Simpson and Marwick were actually acting for Anne's husband at their divorcing, the same solicitors. And who was adjudicating at the divorce hearing? The, what, the same sheriff. And that's a matter of public record, 3rd of December 2003. So, sheriff, you are lying. You do know the father of Anne Gregor. And as far as we know, you, you know him very well indeed. But you certainly knew him. Also, he also knows Greg Mackey, the son. Okay? Because... Uh, in either 1998 or 1999, we're not quite sure, uh, Greg Mackey was charged with lewd and libidinous behavior. And who was his solicitor prior to becoming sheriff? The one, the same man himself, he represented him. So he has, uh, in the legal terms, I believe, uttered, uttered two falsehoods on his statement against me. Oh, these are the kind of people that we're dealing with. I think my time must be just about up now, is it? It is, it is, I thought so. Oh, yes, oh, fine, that's, that's good. Well, thank you very much for listening. There's so much more I would like to have told you. Um, I don't take too much notice of my bail conditions because include this, some ambiguity. It's, they're quite uh, draconian in some ways. But um, one of the, uh, the uh, points made in uh, my uh, uh, bail conditions are that I should do nothing to prevent the course of justice. <laughs> and I have no intention of doing anything to prevent the course of justice. Robert Green. An example to us all.